أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيوم يوم الدين For the love of our beloved Prophet and his beloved progeny, please recite a second salawat. For the hastening in the return of our beloved 12th Imam, please recite a third and final salawat. We want to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this chance, for the opportunity, for the tawfiq that we have been given to gather here tonight and also in the following 10 or 11 nights that we gather here to not only mourn the tragedy of Hussein, mourn the tragedy of Abu Abdullah, but also to learn the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. The power, the strength that these 10 nights of Muharram have, brothers and sisters, the power that they have is somewhat beyond our imagination. When we think about these 10 nights, when we think about the love of Abu Abdullah, sometimes we don't really understand what type of an effect it can have on our souls. This is why during the time of the sixth Imam, one of his companions came to the sixth Imam with a very important question. Recite a salawat, please. This companion came to the sixth Imam, asked the Imam a question. He said, Ya Abu Abdullah, and in the ahadith, when they say Abu Abdullah, they're referring to the sixth Imam, not to the third Imam. Ya Abu Abdullah, Ya Abna Rasulullah, I've heard this hadith multiple times. People keep saying, Inna al Husayna misbah al Huda wa Safina tun Najat. I hear that people say that Hussein is the lantern, the light of guidance, and he's the ark of salvation. What do you think about this? The sixth Imam verified the hadith. He said, Yes, that's correct. This companion of the sixth Imam went a step further. He said, Okay, I understand that. But the question that I have is, aren't all of you ma'asum? All of you are amongst the Ahlul Bayt. Why is it that the third Imam, Imam al Hussein, is singled out in this phrase? To which the sixth Imam responded, he said, Naam, kulluna sufunun najat. All of us are arcs of salvation. Lakin safina tu jaddi al Hussein, awsa' wa asra'. But when it comes to my grandfather, Abu Abdullah, his ark, number one, is bigger. It draws more people to itself. And number two, it is asra, meaning that it helps you reach the goal that you're trying to reach faster. So you find that even the imams within the Ahlul Bayt, they acknowledge the power of the love of Abu Abdullah and how it compares to doing tawassul to some of the other imams that we have. Let us pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that as we are going through these 10 nights, we come here, we mourn the tragedy of Karbala, that Abu Abdullah takes a look at our hearts and inshallah helps us to make some of the life-changing decisions that we need to make inshallah with his salawat ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. The topic that we have prepared to discuss inshallah tonight is the topic of honoring the human being. This is something that you find in the early stages that the Prophet had started his mission. You find that this is one of the fundamental values that he wants to instill in the Muslim Ummah. Everywhere in the life of the Prophet that you look, you find manifestations of this concept of honoring the human being. But the interesting thing is when you look at the challenge that the Prophet was dealing with, the people that he was dealing with, and then you look at how the Prophet was able to go about this challenge, how he was able to achieve this goal of instilling this value amongst people, it is fascinating. You see that at the beginning of the revelation, the Prophet is dealing with a group of people who slaughter their own daughters. The Prophet took this group of people 
and taught them that the daughter is the blessing in the house. The daughter is the barakah of the house. He took a group of people who would disrespect their mothers and fathers. He taught them that heaven lies beneath the feet of the mother. He took a group of people who if you came alone to them, you were a guest amongst them, but you were gharib, they would rob you, they would take away your belongings. But he taught them that a guest that comes to your house, if he is gharib, he is habibullah, he is beloved in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, he taught a group of people who were savages, they killed one another to make a living. He taught them that إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ ikhwa. When you come across another believer, that believer is your brother, not literally. In some of the ahadith we, we have, min ummihi wa abi, meaning figuratively, or you will forgive me, literally, this person is going to be your brother. So you see, left and right, the Prophet is trying to instill this value of honoring the human being. Recite a salawat, please. Allahumma salawat. Let me go through two stories from the lifestyle of the third Imam because these nights are dedicated to Abu Abdullah and we will start our discussion from there. The first story is about an interaction that the third Imam had when he was still in the city of Medina. Abu Abdullah is in the city of Medina. One of the Ansar, who are the people of Medina, comes to Abu Abdullah. Ya Abu Abdullah, Ya Hussein ibn Ali, I have a financial request. Before the Imam can say anything, this person starts spilling everything out. This is what I need, this is the money that I need, I took a loan, I'm not able to pay it back now, I have this debt, I need you to help me. In the middle of this, in the midst of this, comes a point where Abu Abdullah stops him for a second. You can see how Abu Abdullah is teaching us how we are supposed to honor the human being. Abu Abdullah st stops him in the middle, he says, brother, you have a financial request, you're struggling financially. You have come to the family of Karama, the family of Sahawa. There is no problem that you have come to me with a financial request. That's not a problem. But the way you are bringing your financial request to me, I want to teach you something about that. He says, what do you want to teach me about this? He says, when you are bringing your financial request to someone, it is best to do it in such a way where you expose yourself less to humiliation. He says, how am I supposed to do that? He says, when you have a financial request, you want to go ask somebody, one of the things that you can do is, instead of going there and begging this person, is to write a letter. You see, Abu Abdullah is teaching us how we're supposed to honor the human being. He says, when you have this financial request, instead of going there and begging someone, it's better if you put your request into writing, and you hand this writing over to that person. That person will read the request, and when he reads the request, either he'll be able to help you or he won't. But at the end of the day, you are exposing yourself to less humiliation when you do it in this way. So Abu Abdullah tells him, you go home, write this letter and come back to me. Inshallah, when I read your letter, of course the Imam at this point knows already what the letter is about. He says, when I read your request, Inshallah, I will be able to grant it. This Ansari goes to his house. He comes back to the door of Abu Abdullah. Ya Abu Abdullah, this is the letter. Imam al Hussein opens the letter, finds that there's a financial request of 500 dinars. Why do you need these dinars? The letter itself says that this person has taken a loan, he has a debt, and he's not able to talk the person who gave the loan to give him more time. And now he needs these 500 dinars. Abu Abdullah goes inside the house, brings out a thousand dinars. He gives the thousand dinars to this Ansari. He says, brother, this 500 dinars is for your debt that you have developed. The other 500, you take it to better the circumstances of your life. And then he teaches this Ansari one of the fundamental principles that we have in Islam. He says, ya Ansari, from now on, whenever you take your financial request to somebody, Make sure that that person falls under one of these three categories. Meaning that as a mu'min, I shouldn't take my financial request to anyone except for these three individuals. He's curious, he says, what, what three individuals are you talking about? He says, number one is someone who is mutadayyin. When you have a financial request, 
You can ask for help, but make sure you take it to someone who is mutadayyin. Now, quick, quick parenthesis here before I move on with the rest of the hadith. Brothers and sisters, this word of mutadayyin, unfortunately today we find that it's being thrown around left and right. We've taken this meaning, we've emptied it of any meaning that it truly has. We call someone mutadayyin and they have nothing to do with deen or tadayyun. For example, you have sometimes in family gatherings, everyone knows this particular person, he has an Islamic appearance. But in terms of his akhlaq, he is nowhere to be found when it comes to Islam. His akhlaq is not Islamic akhlaq. Yet in our family gatherings, in our circles, we refer to this person as what? Mutadayyin. So I was talking to a brother the other time. He said, you know, this family, they're a good family. The father is very mutadayyin, but you know, he beats the children and the wife. I said, that's not mutadayyin. When we use the word mutadayyin, it means something different. This word has become hollow now, where the essence of tadayyun is taken out and we just use this as a tag on somebody just because he has a, an Islamic appearance, for example. We need to be careful. If someone does not have the proper Islamic akhlaq, then he's not fully mutadayyin, this word that we throw around. And then what happens if you do put on an Islamic appearance and you are deemed and perceived as mutadayyin, then you are automatically tagged that you have terrible akhlaq in the house because that's what mutadayyin means apparently nowadays. So when the imam says you have a financial request, you have to take it to one of these three people, he's talking about someone who's truly mutadayyin, not just someone who has an Islamic appearance. Okay, moving on with the hadith. The second person that the Imam mentions, he says the second person that you can take your financial request to is an honorable and respectful man. And number three is a person who comes from a family with a long-lasting heritage. Heritage is very important, brothers and sisters. And then the Imam explains, he said, why did I say mutadayyin? Because when you go to someone who's truly mutadayyin, you put your financial request in front of him, even if he's not able to grant your request, his tadayyun will stop him from humiliating you, from belittling you. The respectful and honorable man will do the same thing. This is the same notion, same concept that we find Abu Abdullah calling out on the day of Ashura, kunu ahraran. This is the type of person that the hadith is referring to. Someone who is hur, he has certain humanitarian virtues. The third person, the person who comes from a family with a long-lasting heritage, or the exact terminology is a family that is asil. Why? Why him? Because his heritage will stop him from belittling you, belittling you and humiliating you. So you see that our imams, left and right that they go, they are trying to teach us how to honor the human being. Recite a salawat, please. Allow me to go through another interaction that the Imam had, and this was also in the city of Medina, in which the Imam again teaches us how to honor Afdalul Makhluqat. In this case, one of the Arabi came from outside of the city of Medina, he came into the city of Medina. Just a little explanation about what an Arabi is. An Arabi, hopefully I don't have to explain this here, but an Arabi is different from an Arab. Arabi were the people who lived during the time of the Prophet and the Imams. They lived in the outskirts of the city. They were not well educated. They were not well informed. And they were very backward. So it was very difficult to deal with a true Arabi. He was the type of person that was ignorant, sometimes arrogant, and he would hold on to his customs very firmly. So in one word, it was very difficult to deal with the Arabi. This is why in the Quran we have verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says these Arab, they are ignorant, they will never learn the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This one of these Arabi come into the city of Medina. He needs, he has a financial request again. He asks everybody, he says, who's the most generous person you have in this city? They point to Hussein ibn Ali. They say, you have a financial request? You take it to Hussein ibn Ali. He says, where can I find this Hussein ibn Ali? Of course, they don't, they don't refer to our imams as imams. No, they refer to them with their first and last name. 
I said, where is this Hussein ibn Ali? Where can I find him? They said, well, right now he's in the masjid. You want to talk to him? You can go there. This Arabi makes his way into the masjid. When he enters the masjid, he finds that the third imam is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's doing ibadah. And as was the custom during that time, he stands in front of Imam al Hussein and starts to compose a poem about the sakhawa, about the generosity of Abu Abdullah. This was a custom that they used to do back then. Some people, brothers and sisters, they made a living just out of composing poems. What do they do? You just go there, compose a poem for the Khalifa, recite this for the Khalifa, the Khalifa will love it. He will grant you half the Bayt al Mal, he will grant you thousands of golden coins. This Arabi, based on the same custom, he started doing this. Imam Hussein ended with his worshipping. He said, what is it? Do you have a financial request? He said, yes, I have a financial request. He said, let's go to our house. Again, you see the Imam is going back to his house. They go to the house. Imam Hussein turns to his servant, Qambar. He says, Qambar, do we have any more money left from the money of Hijaz? Qambar says, yes, we have a lot of money. A hundred thousand golden coins we have. The Imam instructs him, he says, bring me that money. A portion of that money is brought to the Imam. The Imam places it in his Aba. Why did the Imam go back to his house? Because when he went back to this house, he put the money, the coins, inside of his Aba. This time, he did not just go face to face with this Arabi. He cracked the door a little bit. And he started handing out these golden coins. Why? Because he didn't want to look at the Arabi when he was doing infaq to him. Because he didn't want this Arabi to be embarrassed, honoring the human being. As the Imam was giving out these coins, he started, the Imam himself started to compose poems explaining that he was being kind to this Arabi and that what the money that he is giving is so little compared to what he truly needs. In other words, he was asking this person to forgive him that this is all he has. He can't give any more than this. And the Arabi, as he was taking this money, he saw that there are tears falling from the eyes of the Arabi. The Imam asked the Arabi, he said, why are you crying? Is it because the money that I'm giving you is not enough? Is that why you're so upset? The Arabi said, no. He said, I'm not a well-educated person, but I know one thing, that a day will come where we will be deprived of your generosity. This earth, you will be buried inside of it, and the earth will take away your generosity from us. That's why I am crying. This is how the Ahlul Bayt used to honor the human beings. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Having understood this, let us move on to another aspect of this discussion. In Islam, one of the most important ways of honoring the human being is having the proper akhlaq when I am talking and speaking to a human being, when I am interacting with a human being. In fact, this is such an important point that you find sometimes when the Prophet, the companions of the Prophet, they would ask, they say, Ya Rasulullah, why did you even start this mission to begin with? What was the main purpose? What started all of this? Sometimes he would respond with this response. He would say, I came to perfect the akhlaq of the human being. That's why I came. So you find that this idea of having the proper akhlaq is extremely important. When you go to the Quran, in the Quran there's a very interesting verse that we have about this concept. In that verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear to the prophets. He says, Ya Rasulullah, of course this is my wording, let me make it clear to you. If you find that all of these people gather around you, they listen to you, they're willing to give their lives for you, it's not just because you speak the truth. It's not just because of that. That's part of the issue. Another part of the issue is the fact that you have the proper akhlaq, people feel comfortable around you. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ You are lenient when people come around you. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with this idea of so many people gathering around you. So brothers and sisters, it's not so much or always about am I right or am I wrong? It's not about that. That's part of the issue. The other part is are you taking on the type of akhlaq that is lenient, people feel comfortable around you or not? 
That's also a huge part of the mission of the Prophet. It's interesting that during the time of the sixth Imam, this is a very interesting story. When I heard this, it made me really go back through my own interactions to really evaluate whether we are truly following the Ahlul Bayt or not. During the time of the sixth Imam, he had a companion by the name of Mufaddal ibn Umar al Ju'fi. Mufaddal ibn Umar al Ju'fi, although some say he wasn't even Shia, but he was amongst the students of the Ahlul Bayt. If anyone has heard the name of the book Tawheed al Mufaddal, it was this Mufaddal. Mufaddal was the author of this. But most people don't know how this Tawheed al Mufaddal came into existence. What happened that Tawheed al Mufaddal turned into a book, anyways? This interaction that Mufaddal had was the background, the context to this book coming into existence. Mufaddal, a close companion of the sixth Imam, a very firm believer in Islam, he says, one day I was sitting by the grave of Rasulullah, and while I was there, I was just thinking in my mind and just praising this man in my mind, and I was telling myself, Subhanallah, what kind of a heritage did you leave behind when you left? What kind of a mark did you leave on this world when you left? People remember you five times a day. Imagine what type of an impact, what type of an influence you have had. And it was just praising the Prophet in his own mind. And he says that as I was sitting there, I saw one of the famous of course, I'm using this wording. Atheists, people who deny the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A zindiq, he came and he sat not too far away from me. This person's name was Ibn Abil Awja. Famous zindiq during the time of the sixth imam. And the sixth imam has had debates with this individual. Ibn Abil Awja comes and sits there. Five minutes later, a friend of his comes and sits there. And they start speaking to one another. And as they start speaking to one another, everything that I so firmly believed in, they are doubting, and not only that, they are mocking. They are making fun of my whole belief system. Now remember, this is a story that highlights the importance of having the proper akhlaq, brothers and sisters. So Ibn Abi al-Awja starts, he starts mocking the Prophet. He says, yeah, this person was the best of people. Starts laughing with his friend. His friend says, you know what? I'll tell you, Ibn Abi Al-Awja, you know how this Muhammad was able to trick everyone? Recite a salawat, please. He says, you know how he was able to trick any, everyone? I'll tell you how. First, he came up with this message. He called it the Qur'an. This message was so deep, it was so confusing, that the scholars in our community, the most intelligent people in our community, were not able to reject it. They couldn't just get rid of it. It was so strong that they accepted it. They said, yes, you know what, Muhammad, you're, you're actually connected to this God that you speak of. When they accepted it, the masses, the normal people, the layman, also started accepting this message. And before we knew it, everyone said that, yes, we have embraced Islam. We are a follower of this religion of Islam. Mufaddal is hearing this, and you can tell that he's losing his temper little by little. Then Ibn Abi al just says, you know what, forget about this person. Just let's talk about other stuff. His friend then moves on to another topic that Mufaddal is also, it's, it's also very sensitive for Mufaddal. He says, you know what, he even, not only did he make people believe that he was connected to God, he also created a situation where people will remember him five times a day in this thing that he came up with and he called the Adhan. Mufaddal is not going to take it. He's not going to just sit there. He's going to lose his cool soon. And then they go on to explain that, yes, he had everyone believing that there is this thing called God, and he created everything, and things of that nature. Once they reach this point, Mufaddal completely loses it. He gets up, he says, Ya Adu Allah, you enemy of Allah, how dare you say this? If you just look at the complexity that you find in your own body, you would never dare say that this was all a matter of luck, that there's no one behind all of this. And he goes hard, harsh against Ibn Abi Awja. Ibn Abi Awja, brothers and sisters, look at the reaction. This is a person who is not even a follower of the Ahlul Bayt. Ibn Abi Awja waits when Mufaddal, who supposedly is 
taking steps in the footsteps of the Ahlul Bayt. After he is done with his yelling and his criticizing, then Ibn Abi Awja takes a look at him. He says, listen, I don't know who you are. You're Rajul. He refers to him as Rajul. Like, I don't know who you are. But it seems like you are amongst the followers of Ja'far ibn Muhammad. Let me tell you something about this master of yours, this mentor of yours, that even you don't know. Mufadal says, what do you want to tell me about Ja'far ibn Muhammad that I don't know? He says, let me tell you, when we sit down and we talk to Ja'far ibn Muhammad, when we debate something with Ja'far ibn Muhammad, he never starts out by disrespecting us. No matter how harsh we bring these argument after argument, he sits there, he's calm, he's collected. He never interrupts us. When he's listening so closely, we feel like this time we got Ja'far ibn Muhammad. So we add to our arguments. No matter what we do, Ja'far ibn Muhammad never loses his cool. What you heard from us today is not even half of what we say in the presence of Ja'far ibn Muhammad. And then he adds this. He says, if you want to debate with us, that's fine. But debate with us the way Ja'far ibn Muhammad debates with us. Recite a salawat. This, brothers and sisters, teaches us one thing. That when we are a representative of our religion, when we are speaking on behalf of Islam, you're doing Amr bil Ma'roof. There's someone in the family who doesn't practice a certain practice of Islam. You want to bring them to the right path. You are introducing Islam to someone else. You are speaking of the teachings of Islam to someone else. Your akhlaq has to be impeccable in those situations. If your akhlaq and my akhlaq in those situations is not impeccable, then we are doing more harm to Islam than we are doing good for Islam. You find that the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt have noticed that this is one of the fundamental principles of the ideology of the Ahlul Bayt. With that, I will bring tonight's talk to an end. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He helps us, that He assists us to inshallah during these 10 nights we are inspired by the love of Abu Abdullah and that we can work on our akhlaq inshallah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He places us amongst those who are true followers of the Ahlul Bayt. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He prolongs the life of our dear maraja and our dear scholars. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our brothers and sisters, wherever they are, in whatever countries they are, especially the country of Myanmar and especially the country of Burma, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He frees them of their difficulty, their pain, the dictatorship that they are going through. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He cures all of our brothers and sisters who are sick. And finally, last but not least, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He hastens the return of our beloved 12th Imam. Before we end, let us send our salams to the plain of Karbala. Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al-arwah allati hallat bi fina'ik. عليك مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين